one of the most necessary skills you have to develop as a meditator is learning how to read your own mind. Where is it right now? What shape is it in? What does it need? In Pali, this is called atanyu, having a sense of yourself. And often we're pretty bad at it. When things are going well, we get complacent. We think nothing can happen, the mind is progressing. And you start getting sloppy. When things are not going well, you can tell yourself you have no good qualities at all. Everything is gone. Nothing's left over from your practice. Which is not true. The qualities you've been developing may be eclipsed for the time being. But say when your concentration is not going well, it's not the case that nothing else is going well. When the Buddha talks about having a sense of yourself, it's learning how to read. How far have you come in different qualities of the mind? When you suddenly find that your concentration has trouble getting started, it's waylaid by different hindrances. Remind yourself, you have five strengths that you've been working on. And maybe right now the strength of concentration is weak. But look to see what else you've got in terms of your conviction, your persistence, your mindfulness, your discernment. And John Munn made a lot about the idea of using your discernment to develop your concentration. When John Lee wrote the book Craft of the Heart, which was one of the first books in the forest tradition. That was one of the things he singled out as being special about it in John Munn's teachings. The standard line that came out of Bangkok in the textbook he would read in those days was that first you had to get your virtue right, and then you could work on your concentration, and then you could work on your discernment. But John Munn had found that that doesn't work. When he was starting out, he found there were lots of different concentration methods that were being taught are the ones that would have you follow whatever vision came into your mind and just see where it would go. And visions could be endless, and John Munn discovered. The moment he realized, you don't just do concentration. You've got to use some discernment to remind yourself, what is right view? What are we trying to do as we get the mind settled, to settle down? What are we after? And when you have a clear sense of where it's supposed to go, then you can get on the right track, focus your mind in the right way. Both John Lee and Ajahn Mahabho, when they wrote their books on meditation, would talk about using your discernment to get the mind willing to settle down. In fact, in Ajahn Mahabho's case, that was the name of the whole book. Discernment fosters concentration, pointing out that some people find that it's difficult to get their minds to settle down, so they have to think their way to cut off all the various routes by which the mind would leave the present moment. To see it's not worth thinking about those things. All the places the mind could go would be subject to aging, illness, and death, in constant stressful not self. If the mind wants to go to the body, think thoughts of lust, think of thoughts of pride around the body, well, you can do the contemplation of the 32 body parts. To the point where all the possible roads out of the present moment have been blocked. And then the mind will be willing to settle down. And John Lee talks about using your discernment to develop a sense of sangwega, and then from the sense of sangwega to go to the concentration. So at times when your concentration seems to be a mess, start thinking in terms that would get the mind to be willing to settle down. 
by using your discernment. You can also use your conviction, thinking about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. In this case, the Buddha says it's like trying to get the mind to stay with the breath, and you run into a fever in the breath, or a fever in your feelings, or a fever in the mind. In other words, it's not willing to stay. It feels antsy, irritable. That's when you stop and think about something that's inspiring, about what a wonderful teacher we have in the Buddha. How many people do you know who had all his prospects for power, wealth, all the sensual pleasures you can imagine? He's willing to give them up. And as so often happens with someone who's been indulging in pleasures like that, he went to the other extreme of total self-denial. That didn't work. And he had the wisdom to see there must be something else. He's willing to give up the pride that went with his austerities. And he's got the mind in concentration and began to gain knowledge. Again, he didn't get waylaid by his knowledge. There are people in his time who, when they began to re remember previous lifetimes, would set themselves up as teachers. Okay, they could see beings dying and being reborn, they'd set themselves up as teachers. But he realized that this wasn't the end of the issues. There's got to be something better. How could you use those knowledges, he said to himself, to find something of real value, something that wouldn't age, wouldn't grow ill, wouldn't die? They found it. It was as if he had to go through an obstacle course and then was able to avoid all the obstacles. He came out victorious. And then he shared his teaching for free. And for 45 years, walked all over India, northern India, to teach whoever might be ready to learn. That's the teacher we have. You look at the Dharma he taught, you look at the tradition of the Noble Sangha. It's all very inspiring. So at times when the concentration is scattered, you might want to stop and think about a theme like this to get yourself inspired. If you're down on yourself, think about your own virtue, your own generosity. All of us here have practice in virtue, practice in generosity. We're all people of wealth, inner wealth, worth, inner worth. There's no need to get down on ourselves. Just remind ourselves that meditation does have its fallow periods. What they usually come from is a lack of heedfulness. You start getting sloppy. So the cure is to be meticulous. This is where you bring in your mindfulness. So I'm just going to think about the breath, nothing else. And if all the steps in Method 2 seem to be a little bit too much, say, well, just do one step, just be with the breath. Let it be comfortable. And not ask any other questions of the mind, not make any more demands out of it. So you look at those five strengths, and you look at your own five strengths. And at times when any one of them is weak, remind yourself that you do have your strong points, and learn how to bring them out and use them. Because we're not only reading the mind, we're also writing its story. As someone once said, if you don't like the news, well, go out and make some news of your own. If you don't like what you're reading in your mind, well, you can rewrite it. We're not stuck with the mind as it is. We're not stuck with the body as it is. Both of them have their potentials. Think about it, John Lee, as he discovered the different potentials of the breath. And from there, the different potentials of the elements in the body, the properties in the body. 
as I said, there's lots of potentials in here that human beings, for the most part, don't take advantage of. But it comes from taking an interest in what you've got here. So if that interest is flagging, it doesn't seem like there's anything to the breath but in and out. Ask yourself, what are you missing? What are you not paying attention to? Remind yourself of the example of the Ajans. Out in the forest, sometimes with a minimal amount of instruction. But they were able to take that little bit of instruction and do something good with it. Work out its implications. And use it to read their own minds and to rewrite the story of their own minds. Because that's what we're doing as we practice. I talked to a Chinese astrologer one time, and he was saying he didn't like to do astrology for people who were practicing meditation, because they were not simply following along with the path of least resistance. They were going against the stream, against uh, whatever weaknesses they had in their stars. So it's good to think about that. We have potentials, and we can make a lot out of them. And sometimes it's hard, but we can do hard things. After all, we're human beings. And although the example of a lot of the human beings around us is not all that inspiring, there are some that show that human beings can do something remarkable. But as I said, one of the basic skills in becoming remarkable is learning how to read yourself. To use your strengths to make up for your weaknesses. So as you continue to read yourself and rewrite the story, you finally get to a point where it's really good to read.